So welcome. Uh, my name is Roger Berkowitz. I'm the founder and director of the Hannah Arendt Center at Bard College, and I'm thrilled today uh, to be in conversation with Bracha. Welcome, Bracha. Thank you. Hi, Roger. Um, you're, we're speaking to you from, from Israel today? Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv. Wonderful. So um, this, this, uh, the, the occasion for this talk is the year-long uh, exhibit at the Richard Saltoun Gallery on called on Hannah Arendt, the, the uh, German-Jewish uh, thinker and, 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 and provocateur and philosopher. Um, Bracha, what, 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 is your, what, what did you know about Hannah Arendt before, before this exhibit? And, and you know, maybe tell us a little bit about what it means to you to be in an exhibit uh, inspired by Hannah Arendt, and in this case, her essay, What is Freedom? Yeah. Well, you know, the, it's very interesting because it gives us the occasion to, to see how, to see the, the connection and the difference between the work uh, of a painter like me in the studio and an exhibition and a project. Because the work in the, in, in the studio is a very long term, like each painting uh, take few years in parallel. I do few painting in parallel and do a lot of work on paper and drawings and all in parallel, but it take years. And so the, for, to each work, to each painting on its own and to their connection, there are different lay layers and few perspective in my case, even few scales and relation to time and to biography and to history, to mythology. And then there is the work of an exhibition that there is the choice what could uh, give a, a reference and reverberate together and have a resonance with a certain uh, I wouldn't even say idea, I would say question. In this case, in the chapter of Hannah Arendt, each chapter is a question. What is freedom? And I took it literally as an invitation for me to think what is freedom, to read Arendt on what is freedom, to remember what is freedom in different moments in history or to remember that different moments in history, 20th century, for sure, the, the, the idea of freedom was collapsing for groups of people. And this is true today for other groups of people. It is always true that freedom is a huge question. So, so in a certain way, I think because I'm dealing with the question of trauma, historical and also personal, which has to do with a, a massive denial of freedom uh, during Second World War, for example, but not only. Uh, then then the, the question of trauma and freedom, history and freedom, also art. And art is not the domain of art, even when it always connected to politics, is not uh, on the di direct dimension of politics. If it were, we wouldn't need the concept of art. If art was, a, like some people claim, a result of the cultural and of uh, political, then we don't need art. It is just an end product of something so you have. So for me, for sure, the art working is, is originary. It's, it's a, a domain of its own. And it asks the question every day in a sense, but also in a, in a more accumulative way. I ask this question for years and years. I, sometimes come to the idea that there is, we can talk about freedom rifts, you know, inside freedoms. And 
So as I say, I take it in, as an invitation and, and, and I would even dare to say that it's true also for my thought. So I can dare to say it also for other philosophers that for me, the artworking and the painting come first and thought comes after. And the same goes for what is freedom. It's not like, um, I will take it from thinking, but I take it from working in this materiality and with, you turn that it, which is not material into materiality somehow. You give, you give chaos a form, let's say, and you, you engage yourself with things that could be otherwise uh, intolerable and you engage with them to make something which will be tolerable in order to look and then from looking to thinking and from artworking to thinking so so when Hannah Arendt uh, you have to correct me because you're you know more about Hannah Arendt but when she equates um freedom with new beginning with action um, i will uh, not limit myself to these definitions and i understand i understand what is the meaning of that in political terms but but each of those terms is a, is a question and is a problem what yeah. is action? Is it the opposite of passivity? Not, not in terms of art. Is activity better than passivity? Not in terms of art, you know, ask the color blue uh, when it meets <laughs> color red. And, and, and they will tell you something about the negotiation, the endless interweaving. Huh? And yeah. even the necessity, the necessity for silence, if we talk about language or activity in language, and the, um, the necessity of, of uh, you know, uh, if we deal with the question of vulnerability, uh, and then we have to, to become ourselves able to be in contact with the vulnerability of the world or of the other or of your material, then you become a bit more vulnerable as well. And action today is also, yeah, we cannot uh, avoid asking uh, of what kind, uh, because action is not um, necessarily um, creative, it could be destructive. Um, so, so th there's, there is uh, the, the, the present of working all the time, every day almost with, with art, make it that each one of the concept uh, is a problem. What I did know about Arendt and I even, uh, um, mentioned it here and there um, when I write, is that um, on the one hand, she, she relates all this, the new beginning, bring to our attention natality, so that, that human being is not just like for Heidegger, let's simplify a being towards death but also a being relating or having a human connection to natality, new begin that's the meaning of new beginning of natality as new beginning and puts us in relation to creativity, which is important. Yeah. No, I but, think that but I will say the but because you asked me what I knew about Arendt. Yes. And I wonder, I also would like to hear you about that is that the new beginning in my uh, relation to, to 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 this concept 
in terms of what I call matrixial and feminine and maternal and so on, we can talk about it or not talk about it, is never entirely new. That there is the, inst the caring instance, the carrying instance, the, the one who, uh, you know, most of the painting process is, is pregnancy. And I say pregnancy and not pregnancy because I don't want to relate to biology, but I want to relate to the amount of time, the, the relation between passivity and, and activity. And if I will say, you know, I also say about carry, to carry something, what is the meaning of that? You carry the new and you nourish and care for. Otherwise, the vulnerable will not um, flourish, not possible. Somebody is there. So from the beginning, there is a para paradigm. Something is important is brought to our attention. That's not only being towards death, but there is natality. But at the same time, we remain very strongly in the solitude of the subject, in the being alone. Alone, you know, Louis Bourgeois, the artist that I love and admire, she said something, she was many years in psychoanalysis. So she says, you are born alone and you die alone. And in between you can love and you can trust. And that's your work on earth. And I say, this is exactly that. Yes, we, we die alone, but we are not born alone. There is co-emergence right from the beginning and not emergence. And there is copoiesis and not only, and the new must be relativized so that we take into the perspective that which is rejected. And the rejected par excellence is the, that matrixial this transconnectedness and the and the, but this is rejected i mean didn't occur to anybody to include it into culture so we cannot even talk about rejection rejection came later so uh, it's, it's wonderful to hear you you talk about this bracha um you said so many things i want to pick up on but you said in the end being alone and um and, and yet you also contested that and said that we're not born alone. Um, we, 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 we're born into a world. We're born into a world in which there are others and there's rejected others. And, and, and this actually does remind me a lot of um, how Aaron thinks of art. Um, you know, she, she thinks of the artist as someone who must paint, she says, in solitude, um, not, a, not alone. Right? There's a difference between solitude and, and loneliness. Absolutely. Uh, because, because solitude, in solitude for her, you are thinking with yourself and with the other voices in your head, including the voices of the others that you bring to bear, that you think yourself in their in their place, and you think what they would say, and you think uh, from the world from their perspective. And and yet for her, it's deeply important that you're in solitude because only stepping out of the world are you free from the conformities and expectations of the world so that you could present something new. Uh, you can create something, you know, as you said, a new beginning, um, which you enter, which then once you create it, which you do in solitude, then you, you insert it into the world as a work. Um, and you said something uh, to me earlier that art creates invents, invents images and spaces. And it strikes me that that's a very Arendtian theme as well, right? That um, art creates something new, an image, a space, a reaction. Um, yeah. And so that is, I think, uh, I mean, I, I think, you know, this sort of idea of a solitude, a painter in solitude, an artist in solitude, art in this sense, as you said, is very personal. It has to not be theoretical because if you're theoretical, you're 
bringing the theories of the world to bear. And you have to be personal. You have to give it your own, your own sense. But then when you put it out in the world, what happens, right? That's the newness. That's the, that's the spark of invention or the spark of starting something new. Does that sound? sound yes, right? it's, it's, yes, it sounds right. But when I, 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 I agree, uh, as a painter, a lot of my work is in solitude. But, and th this is important because when I talk about this kind of trans connection with the world and with others and with the cosmos, I don't mean interrelations. I don't mean theater. I don't mean performance. I don't mean relational art. I mean, transsubjective art. I mean that there are links between uh, what the one and the other and the one and the other and the one and the other that we carry. I carry inside myself, you carry inside yourself. We carry traces, even historical, and the, the traces carry carries us. But imagine something that goes then in between and is um, uh, even paradigmatically in between. So that it is not either subject that we say, okay, we, we want it, we don't want it, or world, or either exterior and interior, or freedom belongs to the public arena and the inside freedom is not political. Imagine a world where it's not possible uh, to, to imagine such separateness or sameness or separateness or entire. Imagine a world where the, 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 this uh, new or the, the, the process brings something to a world but right from the beginning, this newness is already connected. And so only if we can imagine this, um, this, uh, I'll tell you how I put it. And this perhaps uh, can take a uh, a contemporary dimension when we, we research Arendt, I hope. I hope it goes, it can go from this natality and new beginning and so into something else, something further, which is being towards birthing with birth versus the being towards death. Do you see? Yes. How we, I just simply open it and I say it's not only the new uh, born or the new, the, even the new in us, there is this sense of continuity and the sense of continuity is not just about the generality of the world. You choose, you know, and also you, the material look for you. And so it's not multiplicity versus me or something, but there are few, each time other, others, world or people or thoughts or what come to your mind and become necessary and with it there is a birthing process even if in the end and in my case in the end we don't see any performance or most of the time but we see a painting but then the viewer can do the road um, if it takes his time her time to remain with it alone, she will start to be with different layers, few each time that enter the thing, you know. So you connect through the color and you connect through harmony or disharmony. You connect through certain values, you know, value, the word value is not just um, ethical, you know, in philosophy you have ethical values. The word value in uh, music has to do with certain qualities and tonalities. The, the word value 
in painting has to do with lightness and darkness. So we have different values and different um, proportions and different angles even. And in the painting, you when you are in front of it, you, you start to, it works on you like a hologram. It depends where you look and how, and how you move your body with it. And, and then uh, you are connected to all these levels as well. And they start to resonate with you. We don't only see with our eyes. Like we don't only hear with the ears, by the way. That makes, that makes a lot of sense. Let's, let's actually talk about some of the paintings that are in the show and the series Eurydice, which is, is, is I think one of the, the, the main paintings in the show. Um, this, this has, uh, it has roots both in, I think the, obviously the myth of, of Eurydice, but also in, in your own personal history and your family, um, uh, and your experiences of them. Can you maybe tell us a little bit about both the, the personal background of these paintings and how it connects to, um, the myth and some of these different values that you see uh, or you try and bring out uh, in these paintings or in the painting Eurydice? You know, I started the series uh, Eurydice, or I started to call it Eurydice because I started to, to do these um, things relating to this series even before. Uh, I started it almost 30 years ago. So Eurydice changes. Ah as I am changing, it changes. Recently, Eurydice meets uh, the Medusa, and recently she questioned Eros. And, but it is basically in all of those paintings, you will, uh, there, there is a figure a level where you are in touch with figures of women and children and babies sometimes, mothers, most of them, and th those who are not mothers, they are looking at those who are mothers, who are looking at those who are children, um, naked, a, a moment before they are put into death, condemned. Most of them don't look at you, some of them look at you, and the whole question of Eurydice, um, you know, Orpheus is a big mythology in art. It has a long history, figuring Orpheus. Orpheus is the artist because he lost Eurydice to the night and to death, and he mourns Eurydice. He he's doing his work. So there is a relation to mourning, but Eurydice in the uh, is a figure that was alive. Now she's in she's dead, she goes towards the light and she's going to recede again and disappear. And so this moment where you know you are going to die, but not in theory, uh, in a minute, you go and, and uh, you still care or carry or look uh, at the other somehow, at your others, you try to protect, you cannot protect, you are totally desolated and humiliated. This is related to the history of my family, the Second World War, uh, where, where the family of my mother, all of those who did not die already in the ghetto, found themselves in Auschwitz. And the relative who are a bit uh, uncles and aunts, they were, uh, they were brought even before the period of Auschwitz to the forest of Konari and shot dead. Uh, I do not use any photos of this event. I, I use, I relate to photos from a different event at a different moment, same story. And one of the sisters of my mother who was in Auschwitz, uh, towards the end of the war, they took her and other women 
and children to the death uh, march and they arrived to Stuttgart. And there, just before the end of the war, the, the Russian were coming and the, uh, the German uh, soldier took them to the Baltic um, Sea, put her and other women uh, on a boat and shoot the boat. So it was like dying in the fire in the water. And um, this and other stories of the family are part of my life. That's my childhood. It's in a language that I did not understand. They were talking all the time in Polish, which I don't understand. I, I don't know how I succeeded not to understand Polish. And my mother did not speak Hebrew. So she thought I'm autistic because we, I didn't speak. Um, and I was doing all the time either drawing or taking uh, little pieces of uh, things and putting them together, tearing apart newspapers. And so that was my major activity as a child. So, but no language and the family, they did not talk. I had to later on, much later, find moments of distraction where my mother doesn't pay attention to get one story or another, but majorly when you grow like this, you don't ask question. You tiptoe, you cannot, uh, you know, hurt those horses should take care of you, you cannot hurt them. And you live in a certain silence about history and about their history. And you live with the, the feeling that their love is directed somehow to figures that are have disappeared. So here you meet Yuridici from another angle. Um, the love for the disappeared and the question of mourning. In very recent uh, series, you will see also the move from Eurydice to Pietà because the mourning of the mother, the mother mourning her child is a motive that can that is uh, very preoccupying to me. And uh, very recent in the exhibition is the series Kaddish. It's interesting that in a, in a mode like that, I could go from Eurydice to the Pietà and from the Pietà to the Kaddish. And the paintings are, um, also the recent painting in the exhibition are very much related to Goya to the last series of the black painting uh, of Goya where he uh, become crazy from the horrors of war and paint on the wall of his kitchen. Um, so you have this Kronos, there's this monster that eats the offsprings. Yeah. I mean, I hope that the 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 work themselves, their their what they you know their own beauty, allows the the viewer to remain long enough to, and have uh, at the same time a feeling of certain um, grace or certain um, longing or languishing and realizing we are in contact on deep human questions. And, you know, because otherwise we will be terrorized, no? We will be full of anxiety. And so for many years, this is the one of the major uh, topics that entered the Eurydice series. There are other topics as well. So I, you know, when when I look at the Eurydice 
series and one sees images, figurative images to some degree, although um, mm -hmm. at times, uh, you know, images that are hard to make out. Your paintings sure. demand attention, demand time, and you have incorporated, I don't know what to call it, um, uh, tricks, no, alternative view, alternative images that if you look at them, other images pop up. You, you've, yes. you've really, these are not simply, you know, one dimension, there's are not simply, and I don't mean simply in a bad way, but they're not simply figurative images. Animals will show up looking mm. in different directions when you, when you yes. look at your paintings. And, yeah. and if you, as you once said to me, if you turn them, you'll see whole different images and figures. Yeah. What is that? What is that? Why, you know, I mean, there's a, I, I, I can think of lots of reasons, but why is the, why that deep attention to both figurality and then sort of changing the figurality of the paintings? Um, what does that bring in? What, 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 what motivates that in your, in your practice? Um, it's nice the way you put it. Uh, I smile because I can imagine that uh, um, yeah, I can imagine that when when we see the the painting, uh, we think, oh, there was this, and then she did that. But it doesn't work like that because they are, they are not figurative uh, works. They, there are figures. Jean-François Lyotard called them figura, figura, the, figu, the figural. So I say figuralities uh, pop out, right? And then if you look from another angle or distance, they will disappear and another will appear. But they are, are on, on the one hand, in some of them, not all of them, those in the exhibition, uh, mostly not even, there are traces of erased photos of women and children that that I go through all kind of machine and and fragment them and take only one part and make it bigger and so on. But this entirely disappears in the process of uh, the, one of the thing is uh, is about when whatever you touch you also make appear and disappear, not just new but there is always the, the price of the new, let's say, call it like that. And these are connected. So they will never disappear entirely, but they disappear from the plan of the painting. You don't see them. So all the, the figures that you see um, are uh, arrived through um, all kind of abstract consideration. And it's an abstract painting. You see, I, I put one uh, behind me, one, uh, and you see that uh, on that painting, the, I work like this. I do like this. It's like a partitor. I do it like this, like a music musical partitor, but I know where to put the pressure and where to take it out and so on. And there is an, something in my mind and the image appears. In a lot of them, even appears like a, almost like a self-portrait and I never paint a self-portrait. It's not, in, it's not uh, I will do this and the eyes will appear. So there's no trick, there's no, uh, there is only uh, layers of abstract consideration. I, I cannot, I mean, my heart goes to the abstract just as well as to the figurative. It really, um, But because there, there you find the different perspective and I say perspective metaphorically, I don't really mean, but when, you, when I put my abstract uh, practice uh, in, into action, this, the, this, this kind of figures arrive, which is fantastic, you know, because I think sometimes like even when I go in my garden and I watch the flower open, think about all these uh, 
abstract uh, correlations that go in the structure of, of a flower. What we see is the flower. But if you look at it from point of view of light or from point of view of the sunshine or from the point of view of the butterfly that visits the flower, sometimes my hand is a butterfly. It doesn't mean the result will be a butterfly. A lot of, a lot of time my hands are like a conch, like a seashell. I even can hold a, a seashell to feel it, the, how strong it is, how soft it is, how much pressure it takes and how the lines go in it. And then my body and feeling and painting is, I paint it like the seashell. Then you can see the monster. I mean, it is, it is not in that sense, it is uh, be, I think that's where abstraction and figurality meets in my painting, which is not um, pure abstract and not pure figure. It's not figurative at all. It's, it's uh, there are figuralities, but it's not figurative, but it goes to where, to a point which I uh, feel as, and I think as compassion. And compassion is very basic because it's it's there that that when I say the in betweenness in between subject and world, or the the everybody and the self in this in between zones, if there are other values to consider, so compassion is one of them. So I'm I'm struck by compassion here uh, a feeling with um you know you you uh you said in a in a in a in a public event that we were together at a few weeks ago that um one of the first books of rns that you read was her her dissertation on saint augustine and um and that one of the things you i think if i understood it correctly found Augustinian about Arendt. Uh, you said Protestant at some point, uh, even though she's Jewish, was her, her, her stance against the sacredness of life. Um, that she, you know, Arendt in, in this essay on what is freedom says that um, courage is indispensable because in politics, not life, but the world is at stake. For Arendt, um, politics and freedom means not about simply keeping us alive, but maintaining a meaningful world and contributing to a meaningful world that lasts. And what, what I find really fascinating is that you, 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 your, your topic, really memory of the Holocaust, memory of fragments, memory of lives as they're, as they're being lost, um, you say compassion, and I think there is compassion, but it's not simply about, I don't think, uh, a plea for, for life. I think there's much more to it. There's, there's a demand for a world, for meaning. Um, I'm just wondering how that, you know, you seem very aware that this is not just about the sacredness of life, that there's something much more involved in your paintings. Is that right? Yeah, first of all, um, uh, the, I remember now the discussion, it's fantastic because it continues what we really started uh, somehow already to discuss. When I said that, uh, that Arendt is deeply, in my view, Augustinian, and finally a Protestant, even though it belongs uh, later, but in terms of perhaps education and affiliation and what touches her, there were two things, two main things, three, okay, three. One is that, you know, the world on the earth and how it is the world up is, is entirely different from it. Mm -hmm. With Augustine, even any idea of grace does not depend 
on anything we might do or not do. He says that, uh, you know, after the original sin, man is born, uh, you know, full of uh, badness. And that's the human condition that for Augustine, that, that badness, that uh, evil. And in a sense, uh, nothing we can do or will not do. Uh, well, grace will come or not come, not in relation to that, which is very uh, deep and I think influential and, and important. Now in that, when, when I said that uh, Arendt was, um, she said even in Jew, Jew, Judaism, the sacredness of the self and then, you know, life of the subject. Um, and she resists that, but, and I said that she interprets the, the Jewish uh, tradition about this sacredness in under an Augustinian point of view, uh, because in Judaism, the way uh, the, it's not, the sacredness is not of my life. Sacredness is your life is the life of the other, that, uh, that you love your neighbor as you love yourself, that you are, you are uh, asked, doesn't always happen, but you are asked to take care of the life of an other, yeah. not of the self. And so, when we say, okay, and we don't want that, what we don't want is a certain development of this idea, which went here or there and so on. But coming back to the, to the question, I'll put it even in relation to when I say that we have to think about uh, being towards birth with birthing or birthing with birth. So you have self and not self me and somebody else, I and non-I in my language, never doesn't matter. But the idea is that, uh, that for me to give an idea or some, something or a relation or uh, for me to, to go into that modus is not entirely new beginning. I have to preserve my life so that your, you will be born. Mm. Me dead, there will be no painting, okay? So, but me alive, the meaning of me alive is caring for that painting. So what I do, in fact, I say, compassion is not just like a concept um, which then would apply to this or that. That's not my point. Uh, traditionally, the, the abstract work was connected to indifference to the human subject and to geometry and harmony and detached from life. And figu fig the figurative was connected with empathy. And empathy means I feel the other through a certain, to, through my sameness. And it's even, you know, almost biological, it's very immediate and so on. So I say compassion goes beyond this and beyond that. So that the abstract that is meaningful for me couldn't remain in this, in geometries and, and in a, laws of nature or, or in any law that I discovered during work, but have to involve the, the, the affects, a certain capacity of investment, of caring and carrying. And then the figurative uh, cannot remain on the level of empathy because you are limited to, to the sameness. There's no opening to the difference, to and in compassion, there is then what makes uh, it um, what makes it available is that we recognize this connectivity 
not just to say everything is connected in the world and, and no matter what, and but this is connected to that and this to that. In what way, when I say I, I will give my life for something which is the world, what do I mean by that? Why? What in the world is important and how to put it in the balance? Because, uh, you know, it's very interesting because I think that she's a contemporary with, she, uh, you know, starting to read Freud and all of that. We, we know the period in which she's writing and, and with, with Freud and if we think the unconscious, we must think the unconscious. I don't know how political it is or how, what Arendt would say, but the way death drive is defined is about aggressivity towards the self or entropy, that everything will come back to becoming nature, becoming cosmos. She has a beautiful sentence there in that chapter that uh, there we can go from the living to that which was uh, you know microcosmic uh, cosm and so on but life drive in freud and this is um life drive in freud does not relate to the singular human being life it really relates to the concern of immortality of germ cells, how cells are connected to one another. And, and we see that also in this idea of endless symbiosis and all kinds of ideas in biology. Oops. And so when I talk about compassion, when I, when I talk about uh, being towards birthing with birth, the with is very important, withness. I also say that perhaps uh, what is at stake now, what we have to be rethought is also, if we introduce the feminine in that way, is what is life drive? What is life? I mean, surely the concern for a better world is a concern for a better, uh, um, a universe where there is less destruction, both of the environment and everything. But the, the notion of the human subject um, is and its development is important because for many reasons, but one of them is that we became so strong that, that we, the human being can destroy the world. So there must be a way to enter ethics into the relation of the human singular subject to the world. So I, I see in that a kind of uh, moving on, stepping to the contemporary in terms of thinking, what, what did I read here? There is, um, you know, in Hebrew you have, um, she, she talks at a certain moment about faith right in that chapter that there must be a leap of faith mm -hmm. which is a bit surprising in this uh, in this chapter but uh, i i think it's um again with each term i i look at them as what can it inspire in me what is why faith and i think about the hebrew in hebrew faith emuna the same word you use for trust a moon, so faith and trust. You see, Louis Bourgeois, the love and trust. And uh, also omna, which means support, to bear, to be bury and carry, to bear and carry. Also bury, if we think about Antigone. And art, artist, art is oman, artist is amanit. So the Hebrew have some magic on that. But the, it's not credo, it's not credit. It's not I'll put in the future and, I and maybe something else will return to me, like perhaps with Kristeva. 
It's not credo, it's really fate. Like, we don't know. We don't know. Yeah. And the other thing is about to create, to create the new, the new beginning. Or in Hebrew, you say lecholel. And the, the root of that word is halal. Halal is space. Halal is also dead human being, is halal, in a more metaphorical way. But lecholel is to create and even to dance and even to play the flute. So the way you need to negotiate space, you know, it returns to painting. That all the time we have to negotiate the subject and the space and the subject space and the space as subject and the negotiating of the one and to the other. And so what I'm saying that, that um, in my reading, uh, but it's also a sign of uh, a period that uh, the, the, the domain of linking and border linking and inside and with outside and so on that we need to so that we cannot afford the, the cannot afford this dichotomy. Probably starting at least, at least starting in Second World War, but it was not visible yet. Rach, I want I will, as, as we come to the end, I want to bring up one other, I think, hidden level of your paintings, uh, which you've we've talked about, you and I. Um, in many ways, I think it's it's clear to me that there's a there's a there's a there's an act of witnessing going on in your painting, but you expressed it also as um, an act of rescuing uh, to me, and you you told me the story of of your of your own rescue uh, during the 1967 war. And I thought maybe you that's not something I've seen you talk about a lot before. I think it was classified even. Um, it was maybe. classified. I did not uh, talk about it, or only with the. I, I did not want so much to talk about it, but yeah, a few years ago, like 10 years ago, it started to enter my painting this dimension of rescue and droning and death through the fire and water, but not in the Second World War, but not in Stutthof, but the relation to my own life. And I didn't want to talk about it for so many reasons, but one of the reasons was that, that the, it was not, uh, pub, uh, pub, it did not become public. That all the documents were hidden for 50 years. And it was only uh, recently become, became public that I led when I was 19 year old, I led the biggest rescue operation in the history of the Middle East and of Israel. This is the droning of the, there was a shipwreck of a, a, a warship that was hit by missiles by the Egyptians with uh, 199 people on board those that were not killed immediately by the first missile and succeeded to jump to the water, so they were all rescued uh, through the operation that I led, but I don't, didn't only lead it, um, I could go to jail, you know, then, because I didn't have any authority to lead such a thing, and I was just a simple uh, operation uh, girl, it's called stuck in the desert of Sinai and I heard the, I had heard the signs of asking for help, which I associated in that way, few information that came through the radio. And so I tried to call the Central Army and tell them there is a ship that is burning and getting missiles and we need, they need help. And they thought that I'm hallucinating and they ask me if they give hallucinatory champignon in the desert and where is your commander, little girl? And my commander was of course 
out and the way illegally out of and so I decided to make jump the the Air Force and and th I think that nobody could uh, they the army would not admit that a little girl of 19 uh, led the operation it, you know it took like 14 hours to lead all the the traffic of airplanes and and I built a hospital, a field hospital. And it's very amazing, you know, because in situations of chaos like this, uh, when somebody doesn't lose it, doesn't lose its mind and start to, to work, to act, everybody listens. I mean, they all did what I asked and it took and uh, so 10 years ago, it started to appear in my paintings and I started to, I called it as a code in my painting, uh, Medusa. Both to, to think about it comes from my position of, and I was uh, wounded in the middle of that operation. There was a helicopter, a burning helicopter that fell towards me and I was wounded. And I was sitting like this in front of the helicopter and People who gave uh, testimony, who witnessed, it's also on the internet, you can find the witnesses. They say just, you know, there was this girl sitting and looking at the, the fire and they took me and I returned to the operation room and I continued and I continued. So in the recent years, 10 years, it's appeared in my life again in the form of a shell shock because each time our leaders decide there must be a war uh, or something to solve their own problems. And there are helicopters in the air and bombs in the sound and all this horror of the Middle East, I get into a bad state, but I continue to paint. And so I, I uh, asked the army to liberate the documents, but also they rescued uh, a lot of people who were rescued. They wanted to, they came, they wanted to thank me and they started to insist and put on the internet their testimonies and filming their testimonies. And so the army was forced to admit and give me some high, it's called the Beyond and Above Medal of the Air Force, but only this year. But it's a tragic event and what remained with me and remain, will remain forever is when the flashback come, I, I see wounded people. I mean, young people like me, burnt or half burnt. So they were all swimming for, for two, three hours in the oil and the gas or whatever, gasoline, or I don't know what it is, coming towards me entirely, totally black and wounded and, and I accompany them. And so, and the smell and the sight, I think that uh, already when I, you know, in Israel, the army is obligatory and already when I was, Okay, went to the army, I wanted to be in a rescue squadron with the helicopters, not in something else. But, uh, but after the war, you know, I, was, I became quite active for human rights, working with Palestinians, interviewing uh, Yeshayahu Leibovich and other people. And there were years where I was, I was able to be more active, uh, but I see it as active as a citizen, you know, as a person. Uh, and even this conflicts with the time I want to be alone in the studio. Right. So our activities were on Saturdays, you know, when everybody is not working. But all of that entered very strongly in the last 12 years of my painting. And in the exhibition, you see 
a lot related to not only my experience, but the way it changed me. The silencing, years of silencing, each time I'm trying to bring the anybody official to admit what happened, I feel to myself as crazy. I cannot talk about it because no, as long as it is not official, nobody would even start to believe it. So, you know, feeling strange. When I went to, to France for 22 years, I, I succeeded to, to leave it outside for a long period before. It was always in my painting and for 22 years, it was more or less outside. And then I returned here and slowly it started. Um, I don't know what to make of that experience even until today. Uh, but I know that I know the, the importance of witnessing. I know the importance of, you know, we can talk about truth in many angles, but one of the formation of truth, which is important is, is what from what you say and see and report correspond to a reality, you know? And so let's establish the reality and then, uh, then we can also negotiate what, what I felt, what you felt, what he felt and so on. But, and so taking it to anything that interested me, be it the history, the history of Israel and Israel-Palestine, be it the history of the Holocaust, Second World War, in the, even First World War, enters my painting with all these maps of Palestine from First World War and so on. But I think a lot about who will speak for those who cannot speak. And how can, what gives me the permission to enter certain history and certain other alterity and the traces of alterity inside me and give it certain voice in the painting. So, and here comes the witnessing, to be with and witness about. And then you start to hear the, 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 the pain of the world and the, the, that asking you not to, asking you to make sense of yeah. all this pain. You see, it's not, it's not just if the pain is not justified, the terror is, but then making sense of it, you know, Paul Celan has a wonderful uh, poem on, I think, he, on his mother. And he describes that ev with every poem, uh, somehow, he's doing every poem with his mother, with her breath, with her. And then he says, about her and we know that she had this tragic death and she says, he says something like uh, when he enters this universe and we therefore allow himself to write poetry, which is the big adorno question, how can we do art? How can I paint and even look at and somehow use images of naked women who were going to die. And, so, and he says that with every stance of this poem, I don't remember how he says it, but he says he's with her in her last breath and she's looking for light. So we have to imagine, we can imagine uh, those who even were dying that they, they it's not only us thinking about the death of, but what was the inspiration? What was the beliefs? What were the, what did they want from life? Why did they care about the baby when they're going to die in a second? And you see it, that they care for somebody else. And so, and then it brings me to the question of witnessing and witnessing and uh, when we take it to ethics, when we take it from painting to ethics, 
then we, we come to the question of you know, non-abandonment. To not abandon yeah. those who doesn't have a voice. Some of them will have, when they have a voice, that's fantastic. But, uh, but then you cannot come from outside. You have to involve yourself, engage yourself, be a part of, be with. Well, that's, that's very much what I think we all love so much about your work is that creating, making sense of the pain through the witnessing. And I know that I'm very much hoping I'm able to get to London to see the exhibit if, before it ends with the coronavirus. And I think I'll be able to, we'll see. Yeah. But I hope to be able to meet you there, um, Bracha. And uh, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you and hearing about your work today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Roger.